called Bridge of Spies. If you're interested in the movie, it's about a true story about a lawyer. There are such bridges. I've been on them in Germany. There are bridges that span between um, former East Bloc, Czechoslovakia, former East Germany, and Germany. And we did trade um, individuals on those bridges because the bridge, the middle of the bridge, was the dividing line between borders between countries. And we could watch them cross the bridge and, you know, trade. Anyway, but it, this is it's based upon a true story. The bridges do exist. I've been on them. They do work. So if you're interested in the movie, it's a cool movie. But this is a version of espionage directed against you. Is a take upon a, a presentation that I had to give to incoming soldiers in my unit every week and once a year. And it was a version of espionage directed against the Army. Because we had on Army uniforms with a flag and whatnot, you were targeted for espionage and terrorism and subversion directed against you trying to get our U.S. secrets. And I, um, I went to DerbyCon two years ago. I've, I've ignored most of the social engineering stuff because it's, and I'll tell you why later. <laughs> but um, I sat through uh, a, a talk about social engineering and how, what they were doing and how they were targeting individuals to do the social engineering, the, the bread teaming event. And one of them was a bank, and they were supposed to get into the server room at the headquarters. Instead of going to the headquarters, they went out to one of the branches. And this is what the red teamer said he did. I sat out in the, I sat out in the parking lot before all the employees showed up so I could so figure out which one I was going to talk to. I did their profile. I watched them as they walked in. They picked out the woman that he was going to talk to when he got inside. So we walked in the door, he was dressed in khakis and a nice polo shirt, kind of looked like he was from the home office, whatnot, said, I need to open up an account. She said, sure, how can I help you? We'll come over here and work on it. So they started working on it, and he goes, I need to go to the bathroom, can we take a break? So she said, sure, it's down the hall. When you're done, come back and we'll finish up. So when he got out of the bathroom, he must have waited long enough, she got busy with the other customers. When he walked out, there was an empty office. He went into the office, sat down, and spent the next hour hacking the network. Nobody approached him because he looked like he belonged, right? He looked like visitors from the home office. And so about an hour after he'd been, like I said, the bank manager walked up and was like, what are, who are you and what are you doing? And that's when he realized he'd been hacking the network. He was an employee. And so with his dilemma, this is his talking about his dilemma as a red teamer, is they fired her the next day. And he got kind of upset because he goes, you know, when I do my job really well, people lose their jobs. And he did another story and said the same thing. The next time he did this, um, they had to go to the, to the data center. They were supposed to get into the server room. That was the goal of the pen test or the red teaming effort. So he, he, um, they had security, had 24-7 security. They had perimeter security. They had a guy sitting out in front of the desk in front of the data center door that he needed to get into. He showed up and said I was the fire extinguisher examiner. And he said, I know there's a fire extinguisher in the room. Because he, he examined all the others on the premises, right? Did his job. And he walked up to the security guard and he goes, I know there's an extinguisher in the room. Can you get me in there? And the guy's like, uh, you're not on the list. I don't recognize your name. You know, you can, you're not scheduled to be in here. He goes, I know, but you're the last one for the day. It's 5 o'clock. Can you help me out? Just, you know, help me out if you can. And so they sat there and talked for an hour. Both of them are veterans. Both of them, you know, they had been to war together. So they, all of a sudden, for an hour, they're now best friends. So the guy's like, you know, it's time for me to go, but I, can you just let me get in there? Just check it out. She, Come on, let's go. He escorts him in. I don't know what happened, but the, guy, the, the lead security guy, he got a text message. He goes, look, I've got to leave. I'll be right back. You know, do what you got to do, and then we'll be out. That was the pen test to be in the room by himself. The next day, he found out they fired everybody on the security detail. They fired the company. All the security guys, they all got fired. And so listening to him talk is when I, I got kind of mad because they're using tactics that I was trained to do as a counterintelligence agent to get secrets and to get things from you and get things out of you. And these guys, these red teamers, are using the exact same things I was trained to do. And you're not going to win. They're determined. You're just there to do your job. But their job is to get you to give up your information. And it's gonna, they will do whatever that takes. Same conference. Um, they, uh, one of the, they had a talk about ethics and red teaming. And you'll find out when I talk about another story how they twisted somebody. Um, one of the guys, they had a panel, two women and two uh, gentlemen. And they asked the guys, they asked them all, how far would you go for your red teaming? This is red teaming, people. How far would you go? 
And he goes, look at this. Who can deny this? And I swing both ways. I kind of walked out going, oh my God. I never expected that in today's business world. So I'm here to tell you, as a counterintelligence agent, I didn't see anybody that looked like that, and I didn't have parties like that. It's not like that. <laughs> it's not that fun. I was in the woods. I got frost snip on my fingers because we had a manual typewriter. I had to take my gloves off in Germany to type reports. That's how fun it was as a counterintelligence agent. But this is something I read as I was driving away from DerbyCon in Louisville. I, mean, I, was, I was getting angry, to be honest with you. I was getting peeved because what you're facing as an adversary and it's you against them, it'll be you on your own. I'll know you. I'll know you as an individual. You know, we all think we work for a company. You all think your security team is gonna be behind you when they come, but they're gonna target you when you're not awake, when you're away from work, when you're probably at home or out when you're doing something on your free time, especially if you have a lot of social stuff out on the, you know, Facebook is your friend, right? LinkedIn's your friend. So, but anyway, this is something I read that I was like, this is what we need to do. Instead of um, security awareness training, we need behavioral change. How many of you go through your yearly security awareness training? It's one hour, it's for compliance, <laughs> and most of your people go right back to their desk and start clicking on everything on their inbox, I did it by accident the other day. Boom. You know, it looked like it was from the company, but it wasn't. They changed it a little bit. But we all do it, right? We all walk away with our one year, one hour of compliance training. We need behavioral change. And this is one reason why I wanted to do this presentation, because this is what I'm trying to get you to do, is realize you as an individual, it is you by yourself. When you're out there doing your job, when you're out at work, you're by yourself. You're CISO or your security team, they're all behind you, but they're not the ones that are facing the adversary, because when the adversary comes, they're gonna come one-on-one. -on -one. So this is, um, this is a very good uh, blog by Ben. I was like, oh my God, this is what we need to do in the industry, and so that was one of the motivating factors why I created it, and I wanted to try and get you to do. But social engineering, I didn't realize, I thought it was a relatively new term, as a 21st century term, until I looked it up, and around since 1899. I was like, wow. You know, as a counterintelligence agent, they didn't teach us, they didn't call it social engineering when I was in school, when I went through training. We called it espionage, we called it spying, tradecraft, we called it that. That's what I think it is. But Chris Hagney, you ought to follow him if you can. He talks about it, very open about it. He was the one that was the Maudi, the Maudi, I forget. He was the one who was hosting it at the Social Engineering Village. If you ever go, go watch. And he does now do these um, panels where you can ask the, uh, the Red teamers, you know, how far would you go? And I was educated. But um, I like this, that it's that any act that influences a person to take an action that may not be in their best interest. That is essentially, that's social engineering, but that's essentially at the bound and butter of espionage and spying. I want information that you have. You know, and you'll find out some of the other examples I'll go by. <coughs> it's not foreign countries that want your information either. Oh, here. This is the one that should horrify you all. This is what also made me walk away going, oh my God. So when I walked out after the young man goes, you know, I swing both ways, I'll do whatever. Um, so I went out and I was talking to a friend and I said, can you believe that? And he goes, I can beat that. <laughs> On one of our red team efforts, we were supposed to get the system administrator's user ID and password to the network, who's the domain admin, one young man. He said, we profiled him. We noticed on his uh, Facebook, his social media, that he liked the women. He was recently married, either his wife just got pregnant or they just had a baby, but they, he was relatively newly wed. But he also noticed that they liked the women. They had a beautiful woman on their red teamer that was a lesbian. They asked her, would you be willing to compromise him? Put him in a compromising situation. She said, sure. So, <laughs> so she became an employee of the company, struck up a friendship with him. I don't know how long it took before she got in to meet her in a hotel room or a motel room. She was in sexy lingerie. They had pictures of her when the door opened, because they had pictures of her walking to the room. They had pictures of him walking to the room. They had pictures of her in the room with him in the door and her in her sexy lingerie. She did literally do that. They, she knew there was going to be someone out there taking pictures, right? She knew this was coming. So he walks in, shuts the door, and she goes, no, I'm not going to do it. But we don't need that picture. We already had the others. So the next day, when he went to work, you know, she walked away or whatever. She went to work. 
They sent him a note and said, we want the username and password to the network. He goes, no. So the next day after that, they sent him pictures at the hotel room. We'll tell your wife and we'll tell your CISO, we want the user ID and password to the network. Okay. Game over. Red team won. I'll do whatever it takes. So when I was, I'm looking at the guy going, really? You know, you blackmailed him. You probably caused him to get a divorce if this all comes out. And he goes, the company didn't have a policy to help him face this kind of situation. So I wanted to show to the company, you don't have enough parameters in place, you don't have enough policies, you don't have enough governance to help somebody when they get put in that kind of situation. I didn't have to know any code. I didn't have to know what OS you were running. I didn't have to know what firewall, what endpoints you had. I went and just hacked you as an individual. Pen test number. Right, team one. And that's when I was kind of like, oh my god, you guys are facing an adversary that I, I was never trained. I was not to go after you as a US person. I was to go after foreign national, right? Here we are today, on today's world, you're facing that. You're facing a U.S. person talking to you and collecting information. You're facing someone who's speaking very good English that is targeting you. You will never know what you're being faced with. But that kind of horrified me when I saw that or heard about that. But that's what we're, that's what we're doing now in business to collect information. And red team, pen testers, whatever you want to do it. Oh, wait a minute. How many of you are a red teamer? How many of you would admit it now? I didn't mean to throw you under the bus. <laughs> I should have asked that in the beginning. Sorry. Oh, on a side note, um, how many of you were veterans who are willing to admit you're a veteran? Pua, tomorrow, thank you for your service. Happy Veterans Day. How many of you are Army? Oh. Huh? I'm active guard. Okay, we'll help that. We'll take it. <laughs> Army? Army? National Guard is. Pua? Pua? Army. Cool. This is another person I would highly recommend that if you want to learn how they, how they're, she's doing what she's doing. Um, Sophie Daniels, she's hide and seek on Twitter. She talks, she'll tell you exactly. I showed up, my hands were full. I looked like I belong in the office, but I couldn't get in the door. So somebody, my badge won't stand. I don't know what the problem is. And oh, let me help you out. And she walks in. That's what she was doing. And the other day, I have to admit, somebody at my office did that. It was a young woman. She did have her hands full. I didn't recognize her. I was standing out with a group of people, and they were like opening the door for it. And I said, would you just please scan your badge for me? Just, just scan it. I work here, I know, but just scan it to make me happy, please. Just scan the badge. You know, and the guys were looking at me really funny. And I said, I don't recognize her. And her, she's doing the exact same thing we tell everybody don't do. You know, this is a perfect scenario. Show up, hands full. We're very courteous. Our, in our country, we're very courteous, and that is used against us. Everybody is a friend until you prove otherwise. In Russia, everybody is an enemy until you prove otherwise. That is just how they think, we're, and that's why we're so easy. But what she, this is a, I took this from her blog, and I was like, lock picking, climbing over walls, barbed wire fences, and dumpster diving. Those are the exact same things I did as a counterintelligence agent. The exact same thing. And I found classified information in the dumpster too, the secret, going to war plans. Why use social engineering? Because it works. That's, that's what the industry says. That's why they do it. I'm sorry, guys, you're really easy. And if I went, when I went to DerbyCon this past year and I listened to Chris present, he wants to hire more women. He said, I desperately need more women on my teams because they work. They're good at it. That means you guys need to brush up a little bit. <laughs> Espionage has been around, as you know, it's a long time. I thought it been I thought it been past that actually. But transmitting, communicating, receiving information, and national defense. I honestly believe now we need to change this. It's not so much national defense. It's just I'm trying to safeguard information, and you don't need to have it. You don't need to have it. And you'll see in some other issues, we'll go over some companies that they others did that. Spying. I'm not sure why spying was older than. Espionage, maybe the espionage is a nicer word for it, but spying is what it is. The, the illegals program, I'll go over this one. You should recognize her. You'll, well, you hopefully you never recognize her. That means you never saw or met her in, in Chapman. Uh, Bumbling, ex-CIA officer, he was caught in January, February of this year with, um, in, in China with uh, lots of money in his briefcase. 
And unfortunately, I don't like it when I hear about CIA and FBI agents that get caught because those are my friends. They're supposed to be covering my back when I'm doing stuff, and here they are selling information out. <sighs> and so, subversion. This is, uh, I thought this had been around for a lot longer than the 14th century, but um, do you guys remember this NSA employee? He, would, he worked for their highly top secret where they're creating stuff that, you know, we don't know about. And he was taking it home, and I, he just got sentenced. <coughs> five and a half years, it just came out like two months ago. Um, he was taking home the secret, in, the, the bots that they were working on. And he installed them on his home PC. So we had Caspersy antivirus running on his home PC. They have special things running on their antivirus that when certain things are installed, they, send, they make a copy of it and they send it to their home office. Well, their home office is Moscow. The owner of Caspersy is an ex-KGB. He says he's not affiliated with the, any of that, right? I don't believe that. Um, that's one reason why Caspersy now is not allowed on any US government computers, because of this event. Um, but the, because of Russia getting a hold of it. Amsterdam, for some reason, they were monitoring it, and Amsterdam warned the US that Russia now has your NSA secrets, and our country went and blew the whistle on it, made Amsterdam upset because we threw them under the bus, saying we know now what Castro has been doing, we know KGB has it, and so it's kind of became a big mess. But um, this is what I consider a little bit subversive. Who knew that your antivirus was sending copies of what you have installed on your PC back to another computer? Everybody who knows how antivirus works. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I just, what I, it does. Well, I didn't. It I didn't. Sees a well, bot. Right, it's so going it. to send a signature back. There you go. Then I, I would. I guarantee it's in the EULA, too, the thing you click through that you never read. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, yes, it, yes, it's in the small user print, print, right? You're exactly so he, right. He, consent, he consented to it as well. Semantic, yes. I mean, any any yeah. are, are semantic ESA, they all, they, they they're all, all going to have that same thing. The difference is that every business in Russia is. Right. Easily subverted by the people that run that country. Right, right. That's 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 that's. I would. Yeah. yeah. Uber. Did you hear about Uber? Uber and Lyft. I think it was Lyft. They didn't really in the article. They didn't really say. But, um, Uber had employees working. A, became employees of their competitor. Assuming it's Lyft. And this is what was interesting. Um, their head of legal, Tony Russ, he said, we we're better than that. To be crystal clear, to the extent anyone is working on a competitive intelligence project that involves the surveillance of individuals, stop it now. That's espionage. Plain and simple. It doesn't have to be a foreign country doing this. That is espionage. They could be charged with espionage for what they were doing. This one, um, this is... If you'll notice, I have, this is an, something that happened after the Cold War ended. There was, <laughs> there was an article about it. There were a lot of spies with nothing to do. East German, former East German, <coughs> uh, Czechoslovakian, former. <coughs> and so they said, you know what, we're kind of busy. We don't have a whole lot to do, so why don't you go target businesses? And that's been the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War. These experienced spies have nothing better to do than to come over in the U.S. or wherever <coughs> and collect information on industry. And so why do I need to tear your country down if I can tear your businesses down instead? That's how I think of it as being subversive, right? I don't need to be, I don't need to declare war on your country. Let me take out your businesses. Let me take out your industry that, that build your industry, right? Build your country. So this was, this gentleman here, this is what I like about this one is, he's a Chinese Canadian. He was found uh, sitting in the conference room of Med Robotics, the CEO Samuel walked by and happened, it was the end of the day, he was sitting there at three laptops open on the conference room table. And the CEO walked in and said, can I help you? And he goes, well, I'm here to see the CIO. He goes, well, he's not here today. Oh, well, I'm here to see, to see somebody else. He's out of the country. Oh, well, I'm here to see the CEO. And he goes, that's me, and I don't know who you are. So he called and found out he was, he was in there hacking their network. What had happened is China had been trying to buy a part of their company, and he kept turning it down over and over and over and said, no, 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 no. So instead, they sent somebody to come steal his information. Yeah, I guess either way they were going to get it, right? So, but this was the part that I, I thought was funny. was in his legal defense, 
<laughs> he said he had been struggling to accept the fact he was no longer brilliant. All right, so I'm going to let you know now. Don't use that as your defense. If you get caught, it's going to take it. Um, I, don't think, I don't think he was able to get out of that with that defense, but he worked for a Chinese um, patent law firm. Um, that's kind of interesting. Let's see if this works. Let's see. Have you ever watched the movie, um, the show, The Americans? Come on, baby. Work. Crap. All right, I, I, got, I don't have time. But anyway, if you ever uh, watch The Americans, I can't watch it. I watched it once. If you want to see what real true stuff is, it is written by a CIA, ex-CIA person. I watched it once. I couldn't do it again. He's talking about things that we were not allowed to talk about. We weren't allowed to show. And he's presenting them for everybody to see, to see how it's done. This trade craft is still done. And you can't see it. But it, there we go. Counterintelligence the world because they're the sophisticated enemy in the world. Super secret spies living next door. They look like us. They speak better English than we do. How you doing, Stan Beeman? My wife, Elizabeth Page Henry. What do you do, Stan? I'm an FBI agent. I have to make sure I don't do any spying around here. <laughs> The Americans is a somewhat sensationalized version of Soviet espionage in the United States. Uh, in fact, most Soviet spies in this country were Americans, not Russians, posing as Americans. And they didn't engage in murder, uh, kidnapping, uh, the, the kinds of dramatic uh, episodes that appear on the American. Well, the Soviet Union had, had two kinds of agents in the United States. Uh, the first kind were legal officers who would be attached to the embassy or consulate. Then there were the illegals, who were people that came to the country, into this country illegally, and lived as ordinary Americans. The couple in the, in the series are illegals, that is, they are Russian citizens who are in this country illegally, posing as Americans. They have jobs, um, and they spy on the side. When the Soviet Union recruited illegals, they were looking for people that were ordinary that could blend into the United States. I fit in like I'm supposed to. One of the advantages of recruiting people for the United States is that this country has a very diverse citizenry. So even somebody with an accent, say, can still pose as an American. The most important job that the illegals performed for the Soviet Union was the service couriers. The advantage of an illegal is in the country illegally. The FBI doesn't know who he is. He can meet with sources, pick up espionage material, and then he has to meet with a, somebody else to transfer it. But it's the anonymity that's important. Occasionally, couples would serve as illegals. Um, there were instances where you had couples who were not illegals. They were actually Americans spying for the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union then attempted to recruit their children as spies. The center started a program to develop a second generation illegals. They want Paige to be next. The illegals were not executed. The, the United States and the Soviet Union had a kind of implicit deal that um, they, they didn't do that sort of thing, which is also why one of the, the themes of the Americans are you know, all these these assassinations and so on. But real, it, occasionally it happened, but it was quite, quite rare, and certainly not in the 1980s. Countries never cease spying. Um, and uh, Russia uh, has historically used illegals. Um, no doubt they will continue to use them, but they're very expensive. And um, it costs a lot of money to train them, and it costs a lot of money to maintain them. This couple right here, this is what the show is about. He's a stay-at-home dad. She's the one who had the job. She was an accountant working in the Democratic Party. And when she made it to a certain level, the FBI said, we've got to stop this. And so that's when they um, took 10 of them, the Southern Illegals Program, if you look it up, uh, they took 10 of them and they sent them back to Russia. And one of them being Ann Chapman, I'll show you a picture of her in a second. But she, um, President, uh, Vice President Biden said he would miss having her around. Uh, so this was what was interesting um, that I didn't realize, and if you guys, if you're old as I am, you probably remember that cartoon. Um, but uh, the, this was, I thought about, but spying, we weren't really taught this either when I was in the Army, um, that to know what the other side is doing probably stopped World War III from happening again. So spying has helped out. I mean, I know what I was doing. I know what I was collecting for. But this is what Russia was saying, why they're doing it. So we know what you're doing. We know when you're puffing your cheeks. We know if you really are going to hit enter on that key, you know, the red button. 
So in a way, it was kind of interesting. But John Walker is one of the. He was a. He had gotten uh, put in prison right at the time when I became an agent, and so he's kind of my my go-to guy. He's kind of the bad guy of all bad guys, in my opinion. That's just from my area. But um, I just wanted you to realize that North Korea <coughs> information. We all think it's by hacking us. If they can't hack us, they're going to show up in person. And anybody who's a red teamer, they've said that. If I can't make it through your network, your network is so good, but I still need to get into that server room somehow, I will show up in person. And look at this. Who's going to deny this? And I swing both ways. If that's the mentality, you are hosed. You are not going to win. The red team is going to win. They're gonna, they're, that is their goal. It is you against them. Trust but verify. Did you realize that that is a Russian proverb? I can't pronounce it. But that's what it is. It really is a Russian proverb. And uh, our vice, our president said it so much to Gorbachev, it pissed him off eventually, uh, upset Gorbachev, because that's, he, he was testing his Russian now. Um, but what I thought was interesting, you know, just 30 years later, I think, we're now don't trust and verify, and I think that's because of the internet. It's easy to get to information without me being in front of you. And I also want you to know blockchain is not going to solve espionage. <laughs> I bring it up just because of this part down here, but blockchain is not going to solve espionage no matter what anybody says. You recognize her? This just happened, right? She freely admits I'm Russian. Get her drunk, she apparently told off. Um, I, apparently that's what I read too. Uh, this just happened yesterday. I just saw it in the news. An Austrian colonel spied for Russians since 1990. Austria, the most nicest country ever. <coughs> that's what he was doing. And this is another one. This was found um, uh, three months ago. It was a woman that she'd been working in the U.S. Uh, consulate. She'd been spying <coughs> for Russia too. And her driver for the last 20 years, um, he's now they're accusing him now of being a Chinese spy. He was a driver for 20 years. So it is, uh, it's live and well. Now I'm going to quickly go through this because I think I'm about done. Mice. Mice is the reason why most people spy. If they're going to get you to do it, they're going to use one of these tactics to do it. Money. Ideology. You know, uh, com compromise, coercion. That's the blackmail. That's where most of the women in the sex show up. Drinking. And ego. There are not very many that do it for that. Most of them do it for this and this, put them together. Most of that's the driver, and the rest of them show up. But I'm going to, all of these are going to be used. And this sign was used during World War II, beware of spies. That was handed out. So it was a very obvious thing that's going on. Walker, I'm going to go through him really quickly. He uh, did it for 18 years. His wife turned him in three times to the FBI. He recruited his son, he recruited his brother, he recruited his friend, he tried to recruit his daughter when she was in the army, she turned him in. But he got caught, most of it because of his spinning habits. He was given a lots and lots of money. The Russians loved him. And he, what he gave was um, signals intelligence, that's what he did in the uh, Navy. And he, in his defense, he said, How, I can't help that Russia gave it to Vietnam. The war was not with Russia, the war was with Vietnam. I didn't give it to Vietnam. I can't help that they did. In his defense, he also said, uh, not as his defense, but um, in 60 Minutes, they did an interview with him. He's dead. He passed away in prison. He got life in prison. Um, he, they asked him, now that you know, what would you do differently? I'd make sure I wouldn't get caught. <laughs> that was his defense. All right. So, yeah, CIA Ames, he did it for money. He was one of those highly paid, apparently they gave him, um, the KGB gave him <coughs> his Colombian spying wife $2 million for a wedding present. He's in life in prison. And I'll talk, this, you don't hear about her? Look, you, I, I had to hunt her down. I didn't realize she was out there. She's not in the news. Uh, DIA, she gave, she uh, was upset about what we were doing with Cuba. So she gave away her, our secrets to what we were doing with Cuba. She avoided the, uh, the, um, trial and everything because she pleaded guilty. It's all up in the thing. But this couple did the same thing for Cuba. He got life in prison and his wife got six years. So uh, kind of, you know, be careful if you're going to do it. Make sure you get a really good lawyer because apparently she didn't get any jail time. He got life in prison and his wife got six years. So just be careful that's what you're going to do. I think they did it for ideology because they're really going to have a lot of money involved. You recognize this one? Recognize her? That was just recent. 
Her name is Reality Winner. Best is real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she got, I think she got six years for what she did. Um, yeah, look at those. This is the favorite one. This is the one most everybody falls for. Compromise, blackmail, coercion, something. And if they can't get it on you, they'll go after a family member. Brother, sister, wife, husband, father, parents. There's Anne. This was also a sign that was given out during World War II. This is North Korea, and that's what she looks like in South Korea. Can't really tell, right? All of these women were spies during World War II. They're famous now because they helped us out. But this is the biggest thing. This is kind of what also started what I was doing is um, have a friend, a young man that's a friend of mine. He was approached by a woman that was Russian. I've got a picture of her. They fell in love. She broke his heart. She started sending pictures of herself to his friends. Now this, this, is, this is somebody I know. This is somebody in the industry. This is a young man that his job made him vulnerable, made him a target, and she approached him. And that's, when I, that's another reason why I'm doing this, is because there's, there are people in this industry that are watching you. When you go to these conferences, especially the hacker conferences, right? It's a really great place to go. Everybody knows why you're there, right? And so people show up. So anyway, I, I'm, I think I'm done, right? Is it 9, 30, 10, 30? Yeah. You can go on it. My, my time's not short, so. Right, you'll, don't stop worry about it. Ed. Don't worry about it. Good. <laughs> 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 I'll keep going. <laughs> Thank you, sweet. Um, honey pots, you know what honey pots are in your network, right? <laughs> honey pots is a woman. Right? There's Anne Chapman. That's what she looks like in Russia now. She's famous for what she did. I don't know if you can read this, but the oldest trick in the book never stops working, and spy agencies can continue to use seduction as an effective method of espionage. Who's going to say no? I would think she's pretty. Come on. <laughs> I'm not swinging that way, but I think she's pretty. This, this is what I want you guys really to hear this. Come on, baby. Stay forward and look on the spouse. Weapons in a global struggle. Every human being is a puzzle of need. You must learn to intuit what is missing, become the missing piece, and they will give you anything. Take off your clothes. Her body belongs to the state. Since your birth, the state nourished it. Now the state asks something in return. You must learn to sacrifice for a higher purpose. Push yourself beyond all limitation and forget the sentimental morality with which you were raised. I believe that. From this day forward, as a woman, as a woman. I've had, I've had women come up and ask me, why do you think women would do this? You're going to have to, if I'm going to have to do that, they're gonna, you're going to have to blackmail me, make me do something. As a woman, but I didn't have, I, the army didn't make us do that. Believe me, we didn't have to do that. But for a Russian, this is, I believe, that's what they do. You have family members back in Russia. You got family members back in China. Start paying attention really quickly how many Chinese nationals are caught spying out. Think about it. How many of them? How many of them probably have family members back in China? I'm going to pressure you because I've got your family. That's what Russia does. And that's what China's been doing. You're going to start seeing more of them coming out in the open. <coughs> then I'm going to run through that one. If you remember this real quickly, Iran is not above doing using women. This is what they did. They they created a they took a woman's Facebook page. This was part of her Facebook page, and uh, she was pretty. She was a photographer. So they took her and they created a, for, you know, they call it a SOC, and they were targeting engineers and technicians in the oil and gas industry in the Middle East and some in India and the United States and Saudi Arabia. She was targeting, they were, they were not she, um, their SOC was targeting middle-aged men. And after a while, I was talking back and forth, you know, trading information. They kept, they sent pictures to them to click on. What do you think was in the pictures? They installed malware on their on those machines so they could see what these guys were doing in those countries. But this is what Iran got caught doing. This is real quick. Madam Butterfly, you recognize? You remember? Does anybody? I, I've never <laughs> seen it. But this is this is him as a her, and he said that he was born a female, 
And these two had a relationship for almost 20 years. And this, uh, him and her, uh, they had a breakup for about three or four years. They went back to China. He came back with a four-year-old toddler. They, they got it out of an orphanage, got a four-year-old toddler. And, conv and he convinced, he convinced him that was his son. So he adopted him. No, there was no sex change. I don't know how they had it, don't ask me. I, I did read an article about it, but, um, but he didn't know that was a man. And this was a foreign uh, French diplomat, had a relationship for 18 years, and did adopt his son, thought it was his. But Madame Butterfly was based upon that. Uh, a ego, uh, you know. That someone says that Snowden did what he did for ego. I think, I want to say ideology too. He didn't get a whole lot of money out of it because he's sitting in Russia right now. Um, and he wants to come back to the U.S. He is going to be arrested as soon as he hits the ground. As a counterintelligence agent, the charge of espionage, for you to be charged with espionage, I have to have you handing that information to a foreign entity. I have to have evidence of that. Um, and he's freely admitted that he gave it, and they freely admitted that they have it. So I really don't think I have to have the actual ex the picture of the exchange happening. Um, one of the Some of the cases that I worked on, I didn't have that evidence. I had everything else but that, so I had to reduce the charge to mishandling classified information. It was four and a half months of investigative work, but I could never get where he gave that information. He had it in his household goods. He had secret, actually had these little discs with secret written on it, had a stash of them in his household goods. He didn't know how they got there. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, that's secret written on it. I don't know how he didn't know. And that's what his job was for the last 20 years in the military. He was a signals officer handling classified information on a day-to-day -day basis. He worked in the SCIF. You recognize what those are, right? He's surrounded with it. And he didn't know how the classified information got into his household bags. So I, was, I had to investigate him, but because I never had where he was handling it over to another entity, I couldn't charge him with espionage. The charges got mishandling classified information. He got put out of the army. But Snowden, I'm sorry if you think he's a hero. He's actually a criminal as soon as he steps foot on this country. And I also have a coworker uh, that just admitted to me when I was talking <coughs> to him about this, that one of his friends, after what Snowden did, one of his friends was doing a, um, an exercise. They were actually doing a live exercise. His friend got taken and put into a third world country prison for six months. We had to go get him out. What Snowden gave up, it's not just classified information. We also gave up the people who gave it to us. And sometimes that is the most sensitive thing. It's not so much the information, it's the source of the information. And what he did got people hurt and possibly killed. But I know one of my coworkers, he said one of his friends, we had to go rescue him out of a prison. Third world country, I'm tell you now, you don't want to be in a third world country prison. I've been in our prisons and they are literally making rocks out of the big rock. I saw him over there with a chisel. I saw the mound of cement, and they were over there literally making gravel out of it. That is about as bad as it gets, but I'm pretty sure in a third world country prison, that's not what they're doing. <laughs> Just to let you know. Hey, this one definitely, everyone says he did it. He was passed over promotion at the FBI, and so he gave it up because, um, you know, I, you don't like me, and I'm better than you, and you're not promoting me, so look what I can do with this information. So he gave it away. It was counter intel, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's how easy it is, right? So this is um uh this is my favorite. My zero days are your employees. He's a red teamer. That's what his company does. <coughs> But this is one reason that I, I wanted to bring up that we call <coughs> social engineering. I think social engineering is a nice term for what's really happening to you. It's espionage. It's tradecraft being used against you, and you're not going to win. It's designed for you not to win. And like the red teamer said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. It's me against you. My full-time job is to penetrate your network. Now, your full-time job is probably to keep most of us out, right? But I'm only thinking of bytes and bits and network traffic. And the Pred Teamer says, if I can't get through your network, I'll show up in person. And who's going to deny this? And I swing both ways. You're not going to win. Just to let you know, um, 
this is what I thought was really good, is that sometimes it might not necessarily, if you think something like that is going on, if you see your, your coworker exhibiting some behavior that makes you question loyalty to the company, you don't have to work for the government to give up information to charge with espionage. So just, you can be paying attention, watch. Um, but if you suspect that I talked to CISOs about this and I asked them, what do you want to do if an employee thinks he's being targeted? They're like, don't tell me. And I'm like, well, how do I know it's not a red team effort going on? And you know, and he goes, they still want you to call the FBI. So please call the FBI. And I'll be honest with you, if the red teamer is going to go to that effort, you're going to blackmail me, I want to take you out. I will call the FBI. I want you out. But and don't call me. Um, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I'll tell you to call your local FBI office. But um, it can be sometimes, like, like I said, this young man that's a friend of mine, um, love him dearly, and when he told me what this woman had done, and I warned him to stay away from her, to back off from her, let her go, let her go, but mom, she loves me. <laughs> and she said she's had my baby, and I'm like, I know, sweetheart, but she's not going to stick around. She didn't. I've turned her information in, and she's now disappeared. He hasn't heard or seen her um, for about the last four months. And um, just to let you know, I mean, this is, it's going to happen. It's probably, you know, and be paranoid, please. In your industry, be paranoid and challenge people when they walk in the door. They tailgate you, make them scan their badge. Let me see if it works. I, you know, it, not unless you know them and they're your coworker, all right, but even I do it when someone, because I, I'm, excuse me, I'm talking to people. And so I still scan my badge when I walk in, even though they know me, just to say, just to show good practice, right? Um, but there is no patch. I like this. There's no patch for an untrained user and even experienced security professional who forgets in the heat of the moment to follow what they've been taught. And that's what a red teamer will do for you. So I, I took over. Thank you very much. If you got questions, you're more than welcome to grab me outside. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you.